I'm sorry it's taken me so long to reach out to you. I miss you all so much. Celine Dion's new documentary just came out and she revealed a lot of secrets that gave us fans some insight into her life, so let's talk about that. Starting off, we have struggling for years. Celine Dion first had issues with her muscles spasming 17 years ago. She noticed her voice was higher and that it cracked more than it usually did the day after a show. In the film, she points out that usually a singer's voice is half step higher after heavy use, but her spasms were affecting how long she could warm up before singing for several hours, a critical part of vocal health. Now, her diagnosis developed into SPS, also known as stiff person syndrome. Now, a year before the documentary began filming, she very suddenly could no longer walk. As of filming, she could still not sing due to the way the disorder called muscle rigidity and spasms further affecting her vocal cords. Now, only one out of every one million people develop this condition, and unfortunately, there is no known cure. Now, she did surprise everyone at the 2024 Grammys as she made a surprise appearance to present one of the most important awards, the Album of the Year Award. Now, it was also revealed at that time that she had a documentary coming out. Then there's her lying to fans. It's clear throughout the documentary how seriously Celine takes her job as a touring performer. She breaks down in tears while discussing the show she canceled while privately battling SPS. At the time of the cancellations, she had not yet publicly revealed her diagnosis and instead told people she had sinus or ear infections. Now the star notes that when she was struggling on stage, she would point her microphone at the crowd to sing for her. The lie is too heavy now she says. Now, one of the ways Celine tried to treat her illness was by taking Valium, but she admitted its effects would wear off between the time she took it backstage and when she walked on stage. I needed medication to function, one more pill, two more pills, five more pills, too many pills, she revealed. Now, at one point, her dosage rose up to 90 milligrams, a fatal amount. I don't want to sound dramatic, she added, but I could have died. Now, she did all of that just to try to perform and keep fans happy. Moving on to her identity crisis. A heartbreaking moment in the documentary is when Celine admits that she doesn't know who she is and that she's having an identity crisis. Who is Celine Dion? The star tearfully asks herself in the documentary. Celine Dion is the one who sang. Now, since having to stop singing live, she has been struggling to separate who she is now from who she had been since a child, which is a world-renowned performer. Now, she recalls experiences in recording studios over the years when her vocal cords would start to give up on her, horrified that she couldn't give the people in the studio the Celine Dion they expected to show up. My voice was the conductor of my life, she explains. And then after not being able to perform anymore, another piece was taken away from her. I truly can't understand the loss of identity that would be and it's such a heartbreaking moment. Next is that she has seizures. In the doc, it actually shows a clip of her having a seizure, which is just terrifying. In the footage, she suffers a 10 minute seizure where she is seen gasping for breath as medical professionals desperately attempt to alleviate her painful muscle spasms. Now the singer looks on helplessly as doctors gently lay her in a comfortable position and check her vitals. In distress, she is given a medicinal nasal spray, commonly used to treat the effects of cluster seizures and sufferers of SPS. All the while, her bare feet remained rigid as she battled the deliberating effects of the rare condition. Now, after receiving assistance, the singer is finally able to sit upright and covers herself in a blanket before admitting her embarrassment at losing control of her body in front of the cameras. She tells the camera, every time something like this happens, it makes you feel so embarrassed. And so, like, I don't know how to express it. It's just, you know, like to not have control of yourself. Now, that is just so sad. And finally, we have returning to the stage. Now, since the making of the documentary, it had been two years since Celine last performed, and she was still not sure when or how she'd be able to return to the stage again without a lot of effort. Now, throughout the film, she is seen stretching and warming up her vocal cords, all in an effort to return to the stage in the future. Now, intercut with various clips of her performing in the past, it's clear that Celine has to relearn how to move and sing, but has made great progress in the past few years. Now, cameras followed her into a studio space as she recorded Love Again from the 2023 rom-com of the same name, which she starred in. I want to be able to sing with joy without thinking, she said after a few frustrating takes. Now, they also showed her recording French dubs for the film Love Again and her appearance in a documentary on John Farah. 
Plus, she's still exercising her vocal cords with the hope that one day she can sing live for her fans again. She said, I still see myself dance and sing. I always find a plan B and plan C. You know, that's me. If I can't run, I'll walk. If I can't walk, I'll crawl. But I won't stop. I won't stop. Well, that's all for our list of the five dark secrets from Celine Dion's new documentary. We're all rooting for her to get better and that she'll be able to take the stage to perform again. Number 10, the Queen was influenced. Palace courtiers have dismissed suggestions made by Harry that the Queen was influenced by her aides when she decided that he was out as a working royal. In the second half of his Netflix series, Harry claimed that his grandmother was swayed by the opinions of others, especially during the Sandringham Summit in January of 2020, which was made to determine the future of Harry and Meghan as royals. He said, you have to understand that from a family's perspective, especially from hers, there are ways of doing things and her ultimate mission, goal slash responsibility is the institution. People are around her are telling her that proposal or these two are doing X, Y, and Z is going to be seen as an attack on the institution. Then she's going to go on the advice that she's been given. But courtiers within the palace have cast doubt on his version of events, with those close to the situation claiming that at the time, the queen was strong and sharp enough to make the decision herself. One inside source told the Times, it's outrageous. Harry never wanted to admit to himself that it was the Queen who said, no, you're out. He couldn't fathom that he wasn't the cheeky chappy who was going to sweet talk grandma into getting what he wanted. Another source said that he had deliberately shifted the narrative about his grandmother. When he wasn't getting the support from her that he wanted, he represented her as passive, someone who only sat in the corner and listened. Number 9, The Truth About Meghan's Niece Meghan claimed her half-sister was suddenly everywhere when her relationship with Harry went public. She said that she was shocked by her comments in the press and said, I don't know your middle name. I don't know your birthday. You're telling these people you raised me and calling me Princess Pushy. Samantha has since appeared on Sunrise this morning and she certainly did not hold back her opinions about her sister. She said, first of all, I will not call it a documentary. When I was trying to appropriately name it, it was a floppumentary. It is so much rhetoric at this point and so many lies have been thrown out there, debunked, and yet there is still repeated need to push this narrative. It is ridiculous. It borders on comedy. It's that bad. The Sunrise host then asked her how she felt about the comments made about her specifically in the third episode of the series by both Megan and her biological daughter Ashley Hale. In response, Samantha said that Megan lied about the entire situation and that Ashley not getting invited to the wedding was not the royal family's decision, it was Meghan's. She said, No, I knew she was not at the wedding and it kind of saddened me, but it is surprising to hear that there was a narrative spun that made Ashley feel like she was not invited because of something having to do with me. So basically, she didn't feel that the royal family had instructed Meghan not to invite her niece, a claim that has now been debunked by multiple sources. Number 8, Stories Planted Against Them One of the biggest accusations leveled against Prince William was that he and his office had been planting negative stories about the Sussexes. Harry spoke of the dirty game that was played by the royal communications teams and the media, where they would trade damaging stories about one family member in exchange for a negative story about another one being dropped. He said, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. So if the comms team want to be able to remove a negative story about their principal, they will trade and give you something about someone else's principal. He went on to say, to see my brother's office copy the very thing that we promised the two of us would never do, that was heartbreaking. I would far rather get destroyed in the press than play along with this game or this business of trading. Harry's claim that stories were leaked and planted by royal comms teams to remove a negative story about their principal really comes and goes without much context. In fact, a lot of the things that Harry has been saying on this point seems to be referring to what he witnessed as a child with his father's office. But then he says that he saw William's office do the very same thing without explaining why he thinks this or what stories he believes were planted or traded. Number seven, the renovation controversy. Meghan and Harry joked that their first royal home was too small and not what anyone would expect from a property in palace grounds. Before they got married, the couple arrived in Nottingham College Cottage, which is a grace and favor home in the grounds of Kensington Palace. And they later moved to Frogmore Cottage in Home Park, Windsor. But Meghan and Harry lament the reality of living at the cottage, which they says sounds like a palace, but it really wasn't. 
Harry said, as far as people were concerned, we were living in a palace and we were in a cottage on the palace grounds. Meghan said, Kensington Palace sounds very regal. Of course it does. It says palace in the name, but Nottingham Cottage was so small. He complained about how it had very low ceilings and insisted that Harry would often bump his head because of them. This was one of the worst parts of the docuseries as they tried their best to make the property seem undesirable. Of course, they did not address the renovation controversy at all. In fact, they subtly justified it. If you didn't know, they were accused of using exorbitant amounts of taxpayer funds to renovate the home, which was a little over $3 million. They eventually repaid it all, but only after being criticized in the name of public interest. Number six, claims of jealousy. Amidst the list of bombshell accusations in the second installment of the series, viewers could not help questioning something that Harry said about his wife. He truly believed that there was some kind of jealousy from other royals towards Meghan, given the amount of media attention that she was receiving. He said, the issue is when someone who's marrying in, who should be a supporting act, is then stealing the limelight or doing the job better than the person who was born to do this, that upsets people. It upsets the balance. Because you've been led to believe that the only way your charities can succeed and your mission can grow is if you are on the front pages of those newspapers. Harry then gave an example, saying that the first time the penny dropped was when he and Meghan were at Buckingham Palace after a joint event with every senior member of the royal family. That morning, every paper had Meghan front and centre, with Kate Middleton on the side. According to the couple, it was at this point that they started being targeted by the monarchy that wanted them to fail because they stole the limelight. But this is represented with no evidence. In fact, the idea is mostly proposed by friends or contributors that were interviewed, which is a device that somehow leaves you feeling that the couple weren't quite prepared to say certain things themselves, but were quite happy for others to do so. Number five, excluded from the family. The couple spoke about the moment they saw the rest of the family at Westminster Abbey for the Commonwealth service. This was apparently the first time they saw each other in person since announcing their decision to step back from their duties. And Harry said the meeting both looked and felt cold. He said, I felt really distant from the rest of my family, which is interesting because so much of how they operate is what it looks like, not what it feels like, but it looked cold and it also felt cold. After discussing the death of his grandfather, Prince Philip, Harry brought up the time that he flew back to the UK to attend his funeral and admitted that it was hard going back for the first time since he and Meghan had left the family. It was difficult talking to his father and brother because they very much focused on the same misinterpretation of the whole situation. He said, none of us wanted to talk about it at my grandfather's funeral, but we did. I've had to make peace with the fact that we're probably never going to get a genuine apology or a genuine accountability. My wife and I, we're moving on, we're focused on what's coming next. So Harry believes that when he returned to the UK, his family were already giving him the cold shoulder. And it was at this moment that he realized they would never apologize for what they've apparently done. Number four, the Sandringham Summit. In the fifth episode of the series, Harry talks about a meeting that took place within the family to discuss the couple's decision to break away. He claimed that the reason that Meghan wasn't there was because there were arrangements made to ensure that she was not in the room at the time. Harry said, it was terrifying to have my brother scream and shout at me and my father say things that simply weren't true and my grandmother sit quietly in the corner and sort of take it all in. He described that meeting as hard and said it ended without a solid plan of action. He said, the saddest part of it was the wedge created between myself and my brother, so that now he's on the institution side. The claim that Prince William screamed and shouted at Harry during the so-called Sandringham Summit discussing their future was an uncomfortable one, but it does actually make sense given the heated feelings on all sides at the time. But his suggestion that his father said things that were not true in that same meeting is largely meaningless because he provides no context or further explanation as to what he could have been lying about. It seems as though the docuseries is deliberately filled with lots of ambiguity as Harry and Meghan make a lot of assertions but offer very little facts to back them up. Number three, Meghan praised by a crew member. Something that didn't sit right with a lot of viewers was a clip about the Freedom Flight when Meghan was leaving the UK for good after her final royal appearance, which was attending the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey. 
apparently one of the crew members on the flight came up to her and thanked her for her royal service, which made her very emotional. She recalled the moment saying, I get on the plane and not the pilot, but whoever was overseeing the crew, he came and he knelt next to my seat and took his hat off. I just remember looking at him and he goes, we appreciate everything you did for our country. Megan explained that it was the first time someone had recognized the sacrifice that she made. She said, not for my own country, for this country, it's not mine. And that's the piece that's so triggering because you go and it still wasn't good enough and you still don't fit in. According to Megan, once she landed in Canada, she collapsed in the arms of one of the security guards and started crying, saying, I tried so hard, which the security guard apparently says, I know you did, ma'am. The added drama might have been necessary for something on Netflix, but a lot of this seems more like the plot of one of their TV shows rather than a legitimate fact-based documentary. Number two, attacked by the media. The documentary was loaded with negative headlines about Meghan, insinuating that this is what pushed them to the breaking point. Harry said the toll was visible, the emotional toll that it was having on both of us, but especially my wife. We're going to have to change this for our own sake. He claimed that after their 2018 wedding, that was when the press really started to turn on them. Over six hour long episodes, Harry and Meghan made it clear that they were crushed by the notoriously toxic tabloids, who were so egregiously racist and sexist in covering her. But it was the palace's lack of support that really broke them. The firm was unwilling to bend on their advantageous agreement with the royal press. In fact, since the docuseries aired, more and more people have been calling out the media for attacking Meghan. Top Gear's Jeremy Clarkson wrote a column in The Sun, which has provoked a mass outcry online, with social media users labeling it vile and horrific. In an article for the paper, Clarkson wrote that he loathed Meghan on a cellular level and described a detailed depiction of her getting publicly shamed. As a result, his comments have drawn widespread condemnation. Number one, their plans were ruined. In terms of the plan to give up their royal duties, Harry said that he initially asked for a half-in, half-out arrangement, where he and Meghan would have their own jobs but would still work in support of the Queen. The couple then described creating a plan that they hoped would bring them both safety and peace of mind. Mind. They talked about relocating to New Zealand or South Africa before they ultimately settled on Canada. In 2019, Harry claimed that the palace signed off on them moving to South Africa, which is something that the offices of his father, his brother, his grandmother knew about. He said no one else knew. It was very much an internal document. Then it was leaked to the Times newspaper and the whole plan was then scrapped. After this, he spoke to Charles over the phone about the possibility of them moving to Canada, and he was told to put the request in writing. Only later did they find out that the tabloids knew about their proposal, as the emails to his father had somehow been leaked. According to Harry, once their Canada plans became a public debate, it was never going to happen. Meghan was a little more bold in making the accusation. She said, his dad said put it in writing, and he did. And it was just five days later that it was on the front page of a newspaper. So they made no effort to hide that they clearly believed the family was well and truly behind the leak. Britney Spears is finally free from her father, Jamie, after a judge ruled to suspend her father from her conservatorship, along with setting a court date to decide on the fate of the conservatorship in general. I'm Mackenzie, and let's get into all the details. The conservatorship that has controlled the life of Britney Spears for 13 years now looks to be nearing the end after a judge suspended her father from control over her life. Britney responded to the news saying she was, quote, on cloud nine right now. Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Brenda Penny removed Jamie Spears from oversight of his daughter's $60 million estate and set a November date to discuss whether to terminate the entire arrangement, which has been Britney's goal from the start. Britney shared an Instagram post after the ruling of her flying a plane over a tropical destination, clearly enjoying her freedom. Jamie Spears responded to this news via a statement from his lawyer. In the statement, he claimed he had always tried to do what was best for his daughter, adding, quote, these facts make the outcome of yesterday's hearing all the more disappointing and frankly a loss for Britney. Respectfully, the court was wrong to suspend Mr. Spears, put a stranger in his place to manage Britney's estate, and extend the very conservatorship that Britney begged the court to terminate earlier this summer. This news comes just days after Britney slammed all the recent documentaries that have been made about her life and conservatorship. As we already know, Britney has been battling a conservatorship controlled by her father, Jamie, for the last 13 years, and she's finally on the verge of freedom. One of the biggest things that shed light on the Free Britney movement was the explosive documentary that examined her life in conservatorship called Framing Britney Spears. And since that documentary got so much traction, other media companies have now gotten on board and produced their own documentaries about the situation. The most recent one just premiered on Netflix called Britney 
versus Spears. But other programs about the situation are FX and Hulu series titled Controlling Britney Spears, CNN's documentary titled Toxic Britney Spears' Battle for Freedom, along with the now favorite one by the New York Times, Framing Britney Spears. A few days ago, Britney posted a video to her Instagram with a long caption condemning the recent documentaries that have been made about her. She said in part, quote, I watched a little bit of the last documentary and I must say I scratched my head a couple of times. I really try to dissociate myself from the drama. Number one, that's the past. Number two, can the dialogue get any classier? Number three, wow, they used the most beautiful footage of me in the world. What can I say? The effort on their part. Although by the emojis that Britney was using in the caption, we can assume she was being sarcastic. She then went on to discuss an organization that she's been working with called The Rose Project and added that her fans should wear white for new beginnings. So clearly she is not on board with all these documentaries and doesn't agree with everything that they're showing. Many fans in the comments assume that it wasn't Britney herself that was doing the posting and that Britney does not really feel this way about the documentaries. One comment on the post read, quote, Are we really supposed to believe this is Britney? We already know she has her phone monitored and more conservative secrets are surfacing. But it seems that Britney's negative comments about the documentaries are her true thoughts, because her fiance Sam Asghari posted a statement confirming these thoughts on his Instagram. He wrote in part, quote, Past docs left a bad aftertaste. I'm hoping this one will be respectful. Sam also questioned documentary producers on what made them want to shed light without input or approval from Britney herself. In the comments of another post, Sam also questioned where the profits of all these films are going and why nothing was going to the subject of the documentaries, aka Britney herself. So that's all for the story today. Clearly very, very good news with Jamie being dropped off the conservatorship. That is phenomenal. And it really looks like the end is near for the whole thing in general and she will be free very, very soon.